Dear friends, thank you for the invitation and for the opportunity to address you. I would certainly prefer to do it in person, but summer and the need to get some rest has forced me to accommodate. Let me begin by putting the discussion in a broader context. It all starts with the understanding that for the first time in human history, we face the emergence of a single, tightly coupled human socio-ecological system of planetary scope. We are more interconnected and interdependent than ever, and our individual and collective responsibility has enormously increased. According to a recent Dasgupta review, our unsustainable engagement with nature can be traced to institutional failure and the failure of contemporary economics to acknowledge that we are embedded with nature and not external to it. So, for the beginning, it would be good to acknowledge that we humans are part of nature and start behaving accordingly. Why it is so important to focus on natural resource management? Natural resources are the bridge connecting drivers and pressures to the impacts and consequences. Natural resources are the basis for our whole economy and life, and at the same time, their use is the cause of all environmental impacts that are also threatening our health. In short, they connect everything. According to International Resource Panel, extraction and processing of natural resource materials, including metals, minerals, fossil fuels and biomass, causes around 90% of land-related biodiversity loss and water stress, 50% of global climate change and one-third of global air pollution. The global material demand is projected to double by 2060 if current trends would continue. In no way we can decarbonize all that production, make our economies and societies sustainable without massive trade-offs. Therefore, the only realistic chance for reaching our 2030 and 2050 targets is to deploy all measures possible to address this likely potential increase. While we strive to improve our well-being, we must reduce the need for additional virgin natural resources as much as we can. We must decouple well-being and economic growth from natural resources use and environmental impacts. Important for all, urgent for high-income countries. There are many reasons why this is not yet the case, but one big reason is the perversive notion that growth in well-being is connected to the growth in production and consumption measured by GDP. The idea of creating an economy that serves people with a function but produces less in quantity is still taboo in many boardrooms as well as at ministries. We should stop giving producers the signals that destroying natural capital is free of charge and we should stop confusing consumers by asking them to behave responsibly but requesting to pay more if they do so. Also when it comes to healthier and more environmentally friendly produced food. I would be first claiming that nature has intrinsic value, but we must respect and protect. But until, as nicely put by Professor Stiglitz, invisible hand will often be invisible, since it is often not there. This is in the very words of the famous Finnish writer Arto Pasilina, a charming mass suicide orchestrated by the invisible hand of markets. What would this mean in policy terms? Redefining consumption from owing to using redefining production from mass sales to providing efficient functionalities, redefining core economic incentives such as taxation and subsidies. It would also mean making integrated well-being, including natural capital accounting, the objective across all policies, measuring sustainability with a life cycle perspective and looking at innovation in categories of economic ecosystems that provide societal functions rather than in categories of production sectors. Acknowledging the value of the natural capital would almost inevitably, at least in short term, lead to some price increases and worsen the already unviable social situation of many. Not acceptable, of course. It will be difficult to make food affordable if we do not give more attention to income and wealth distribution. And it will be difficult to find a solution for the sustainability aspect without a full cost approach that also includes the cost of the rapid depletion of natural capital. And yes, we need both. Future economic development and well-being depends on understanding and accepting the fact that we must respect the planetary boundaries and treat natural resources in a responsible way. There is no need to explain 
how critical this is also in the context of food and land system transformation. Food systems and land management remain at the core of so much of what we are trying to achieve. It is there where the nexus of food, biodiversity, climate and pollution health so often come together. The task ahead of us is complex and demanding, but by joining forces, by listening to each other and by establishing a necessary trust, all is possible. The only way to deliver is if we all converge and work on the same goal, not just asking others to do it, but for each of us to be part of it. Nature-friendly agriculture, it's a must. It has the potential to positively impact the social, economic and environmental dimensions of sustainable agriculture. It is more than just about farming practices. It is about entire food value chain. Many of the farm practices widely considered to contribute to a nature-friendly approach are neither new nor they are rocket science. What is potentially different is the evolving knowledge, particularly at the farm level, on how to harness the benefits of these practices to maximize the impact. An important part of the solutions is linked to governance. I know from my own experience that the difficult reality for policymakers responsible for the environment is that they have the responsibility for solving the problems, while the tools for solving them are mostly not in their hands. They depend on effective solutions coming from other policy-related colleagues as well as from private sector players. Agriculture belongs among areas with high environmental impacts. Only by bringing the table together those in charge of solving the problems with those responsible for creating the pressures and in need for a change, can we develop effective joint vision, joint targets, joint policy pathways and joint responsibility for the success of the needed transition more environmentally friendly, but also economically and socially feasible and attractive for all the food-related players, farmers in particular. Good policymaking, it's always a two-way street. The science shows very clearly that the greatest risks for food security come from the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis. Combined, the fate of farmers and food security are to a large extent dependent on our relation to the environment. There is a high level of agreement that the transition to a more sustainable society and economy is unavoidable, but ultimately it will be about the speed and scale of that transition. It will be about addressing the drivers and pressures that cause the challenges we are facing, and it will be about providing further systemic perspective to guide decision-making. We should start with meeting human needs rather than from the overuse and underutilization of natural resourcing, chasing higher production growth rates and the logic of putting more products on the markets, regardless of the price we are collectively paying. We are in a race against time. To remain credible, countries with the highest consumption footprint and trespassing planetary boundaries most, Europe included, must lead by example. Very demanding and responsible task, no doubt. But using that as an excuse for not taking an urgent action is neither useful nor acceptable. Thank you for listening and I wish you fruitful debates.